Now I visited, um, for some of you who've been around a bit, I visited uh, Greenford Baptist Church very early in my uh, role as General Secretary. I just came to be part of the service um, and so it must have been in 2014, it was the first year that I was in post. And I was struck by two things coming here. The first was, you might not realise this, the first was that actually you gave someone, you asked someone to be my host for the day. And actually that was such a beautiful thing. Um, in my role, I go to churches as a single person, effectively. I, my, I am married and have a family, but they don't often have the privilege of coming around with me. Um, and so actually to have someone who you ask someone to kind of be my uh, sort of guide, to sit with me, to be my host, it was really wonderful. I go to all these churches I've never been to before, and uh, just to have someone sit alongside where I could go and say, oh, what's that about, or whatever, <laughs> uh, and who helped me get a cup of tea, show me where the ladies was, oh, just to have that sense of hospitality was a very precious thing, and it really touched my heart. So I want to say thank you for that. And I do often tell other churches about that, as an example of how to make your uh, guests feel welcome. So uh, maybe by the by, but that's a precious thing. But the other thing that really struck me, it was the first time, I think, for me, that I'd experienced what I might call genuine multicultural worship. And it was amazing. I don't know whether you remember that day. It was a bit wacky as well, actually. <laughs> 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 we had communion. Anyone, anyone remember? We had communion. And uh, we did dancing. We had the rain sticks, I think. It was all, it was full on. It was full on. It was great <laughs> and fabulous. And uh, it just flowed, and it was wonderful. And uh, I kind of, I think, you know, we sort of, I, I experienced those kind of genuine uh, attempts at modern, which is kind of like, we'll have a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other, and uh, it's all a bit awkward. But there was, seemed to be a genuine blendedness here, uh, uh, and it kind of flowed, and it seemed much more natural, and it was a wonderful thing. And for me, it was very inspiring. And it gave me a vision of what multicultural church could be like, and that has stayed with me and uh, continues to inspire me and give me a vision for what's possible. So I just want to say thank you for that as a church. Um, and I want to say to you, partly what I want to say to you today is what you have is very precious. I'm sure for you, maybe it feels very mundane or maybe sometimes it feels difficult, um, but you have something very precious and uh, you are like a prophetic sign and so I just want you to know that, and I wanted to come and share that with you, uh, uh, and just, yeah, for me to say that. Now, um, when I, I, I said earlier that a lot of time I pray, I, I see praying as very important, and I pray for our churches and our leaders, and there's kind of three things I pray for quite a lot, um, we'll have the next slide, and that is, I pray that our churches and leaders would have um, a deeper longing for God, that's one of my real prayers, a deeper longing for God. I pray that our churches and leaders would have a deeper longing for relationships, because that's part of the heart of God. And I pray that our churches and leaders would have a deeper longing for God's mission. And in a funny way, these things are all captured in this reading, actually, uh, in this passage, which talks about partnership in the gospel. And so I want to bring this passage here today, really, to just encourage you and inspire you to keep pursuing this vision of kingdom community that God has started here and to encourage you on the journey. Because I realise that whilst, you know, I can come spawning around every once in four years and say, oh, it's all wonderful, but I know that the reality, I'm sure the reality, is not always wonderful and can sometimes be painful and difficult. Um, I was uh, meeting with some uh, ministers of multicultural churches earlier in the week and I had a lot, quite a long conversation <coughs> with one particular one uh, who again is doing a fantastic job uh, where they are but that minister also shared with me some of the challenges and the pain and the difficulties and, and the sense of feeling that this is really hard. Uh, and so I recognise it can sometimes be hard as well. And I recognise too that in life we all live in our bubbles, don't we? Uh, and particularly we talk these days about social media bubbles, don't we? Echo chambers where we hear people like us say things that we like to hear. And we have all sorts of bubbles in our lives, don't we? Maybe generational bubbles of our age group. Uh, maybe uh, ethnic bubbles of ethnicity around our heritage or our traditions and our culture. Maybe bubbles of class. We might think these people are more posh or less posh than us or different to us. 
we might have bubbles of politics, and of course we mustn't mention at this time Brexit. Um, <laughs> the danger is, isn't it, that we love to create sort of us and them, don't we? It's whatever it's about, it, it can be all sorts of things, we create this feeling of us and them. You see it in local churches, you see it across towns, you see it nationally, which is one of the reasons I actually love that video. When I saw that video, I thought, yes! Yes, we've got to get beyond this sense of us and them and they're different to me and I don't like they do this, no, no, no. Because actually, what we share in common is so much more precious and so much more powerful. Uh, and I just felt that video inspires me to sort of seek that unity in Christ in the face of our natural tendency to build barriers. And so, in this passage... Um, what I want to say is, what can we learn about partnership in the gospel? What can we learn about partnership in the gospel from here? Now, I don't think you don't know this, but I think it's that sometimes we need to continue to understand and to be re-inspired with this stuff. And so the first thing I think this passage tells us is about the basis of our partnerships. And the basis of our partnership is grace. Yep, yeah, there we go. In verse 7, it says, I'm using the NIV, use a slightly different version, but it's still the same. Uh, he says at the end of verse 7, Paul says, um, all of you share in God's grace with me. All of you share in God's grace with me. All. And God's grace is an amazing thing, isn't it? Because of his grace, because of his great love, he sent Jesus to bring us to new life and into a relationship with him through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. It's not about our goodness, it's not about our status, it's not about our skin colour, it's not about the size of our paycheck, it's not about how many GCSEs we got, it's not about anything like that. Grace is all about Jesus and what he's done for us. I am loved and accepted and forgiven and set free because of what God has done for me in Christ. You are loved and accepted and forgiven and set free because of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. That is grace. <coughs> that is grace. And there are no exceptions. No exceptions to the rule. We all come to God by grace. And that's why we love God so much, isn't it? That's why we worship him, because he first loved us. And I think that's just a really, really important thing to remember when we're trying to uh, seek to pursue this vision of kingdom community, about remembering about God's grace. We are all equal. We are all share that sense of grace under God. And none of us is better than the other for any reason at all. We are loved and accepted because of Jesus. <coughs> the first one actually gives us a little glimpse of a lot of the practical outworking of what scripture means by grace and about what partnership looks in the church. The first verses of letters are often not <coughs> fruitful places to look, but look at it. Verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with, together with the overseers and deacons. Isn't that a lovely phrase? Mm -hmm. Together with. And that's what partnership means. Together with, all of us bundled up together, warts and all, all our differences, but together with, uh, we are in God. So scripture makes it clear that the basis of our partnership in the gospel must always be based on God's grace. All of us are equal. All of us share that dignity of being loved and precious and created from God. And that is an amazing thing. So if the basis of partnership in, in the gospel is grace, then what are the, what's the conditions or the soil that it needs to grow in? And I think, for me, it's very simple. It's undoubtedly love. So, yeah, there we go. Wonderful, you're ahead of me there. Um, so one thing I really love about this passage, and maybe that's why it came to me as I was coming here, was it's completely filled with a sense of deep love and affection, isn't it? It's not a kind of formal letter, dear sirs, I write to you forthwith about blah, blah, blah. You know, it has such a real depth of relationship, doesn't it? In verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. In verse 4, I always pray with joy for you. And verse 7, since I have you in my heart. Isn't that wonderful? I have you in my heart. And verse 8, again, this is so precious. God can testify how I long 
for all of you with the affection of Christ. Now this isn't some distant, official, <laughs> formal kind of relationship. This is about relationships that have been nurtured in love. And they, they, they are care. And it's powerful, these are powerful and emotional words that demonstrate, I believe, the relationship between Paul and the church at Philippi and the great love that they shared one for the other. Now, I don't know whether how many of you managed to get to see uh, the royal wedding, Harry and Meghan's royal, we and royal wedding. It was an amazing uh, affair, wasn't it? And a great day. It was my dad's birthday that day, but he insisted that he had to come watch the whole these real royalists. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, he bought a video player um, for the royal wedding, for Charles and Diana's royal wedding. So, you know, he had to get the technology so he could keep watching it. Um, anyway, so he came around and we, we, I had to produce a, a meal that was kind of like a, a rolling buffet. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, they needed to see the thing, so we had a kind of like rolling buffet. It was a great day and lovely to share something like that together. But for me, the highlight was that powerful sermon, wasn't it, by Bishop yes. Michael yes. Parry? Wasn't it amazing? Yes. I'm not sure that the pulpit has ever been so rocked <laughs> as it was then. And in fact, there were points when I was afraid he was going to knock those candles off. <laughs> I thought there was going to be a fire in the church uh, in a way they hadn't anticipated. Uh, so it was absolutely amazing, wasn't it? And I, I, if you were like me, we just sat there thinking like, wow, like, wow. And here is this man preaching to thousands, thousands of millions of people, uh, just like, whoa, yes. a real God moment. And he set a fire, I think, among the millions of those listening around the world. And his message was very simple, wasn't it? God is love. Love is central. It's who God is. It's not just a thing that God does. It is who God is. And it's so important. I come, actually, if you ever invite me to preach here, I can preach about love from 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, I'll just digress. Am I allowed to digress? Yeah, oh, yeah. Just digress. <laughs> um, I once had to get ready for that for a sermon, for a wedding. And I, I they, the couple chose that, and I was a bit like, oh, 1 Corinthians 13 again. Yeah. Of course, we're very holy. We never think that's ministry. <laughs> but I was like, come on, Lord, and what, what can I bring fresh to this? As I was in, And I started reading the scripture to prepare. And as I read the scripture, um, God really kind of punched me in the eyes, really, because it says, doesn't it, there, without love, it is nothing. Mm. And, like, mm -hmm. and, cause I rem and I thought, well, actually, I think I'd kind of subtly thought to myself, actually, without love, it's kind of not as good. Uh, without <laughs> love, it's kind of, uh, it, 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 it'll do. It's, you know, do you know what I mean? It's kind of okay. But actually, the scripture says, without love, it's nothing. Nothing. And I, I, okay, that really convicted me. So I was, as always in preaching, you're often convicted by your own sermon um, more than anyone else. Love is central. Without love, it is nothing. Nothing. And that's something to hear for us in churches, isn't it? Because so, and I know this because we want to be, we want to press on and we want to be at the forefront and cutting edge of the gospel and we want to be doing all these things and amazing things. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, without love, it's nothing. And sometimes love takes us the slow and the painful and the meandering way. Um, and sometimes we wish love wouldn't take us that way at all. Why can't we just sort this out and be with people that are fine and just get on with it? But without love, we are nothing. And there's something in that experience of love together that we are being a prophetic sign and a symbol in the world. And it's in his great love that moves God to send Jesus... And it is Jesus himself who says to us, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. <clears throat> and so we too, as disciples of Jesus, are to live in love and to overflow with love. Um, and it's this love which provides the rich and fertile soil in which partnerships can flourish and grow. Kingdom community is based in the soil, in the atmosphere of love. That's how it grows. And this needs to be true for our partnership in the gospel within the church, across churches, across the nation, even internationally. And in verse 9 it says there, this is Paul's prayers, one of those amazing prayers of scripture, isn't it? My prayer is this, that your love may abound. And he's not saying that love isn't already there. Get your act together, you Philippians, so we need some love on the, on the table. He's saying no. He, he knows that they love. But he's saying he wants more love. 
He wants their love to abound. And this is what I pray for myself. More love, more compassion. That I might be more rooted in God's love. That love may abound. And he's praying that the church uh, in Philippi would know and experience and share more and more and more the limitless reservoir of God's love. And so that's my prayer for you today as well. <laughs> it's not that you don't love. <laughs> It's not that you don't love, but that you may abound in love. You may abound in love in this church. You may abound in love in the churches of Greenford. You may abound in love as part of our movement, as part of the church in the UK. And that as you abound in love, you might work out what that means in the nitty gritty of life. Because it's all very well in theory in sermons, isn't it? It's when you actually have to work it out. What does it mean to love when you disagree with someone or you see things differently? But actually that your love would abound as you work it out in the nitty-gritty of life. So whilst love is the vital soil needed to nurture our partnerships, um, the same love also sends us out and leads us to action, as I said. And verse 5 uses that phrase, doesn't it? It's partnership in the gospel. And the Greek word there we translate as partnership is koinonia, which actually carries that sense of having something in common. I think that came out of the Teesside video, didn't it? That we share this common sense of worshipping Christ and sharing him. But it also means a wholehearted, active participation. <coughs> we'll get stuck in partnership. is isn't something you stand on the edge and think, hmm, what's going on over there? Partnership is something that you jump into and you participate in and you share and you roll your sleeves up and you get involved in. So partnership in the gospel begins with grace as its basis and love is its soil, heartfelt relationships that are simply beautiful in themselves. But partnerships never rest there. It's not just about having a wonderful holy club where we all get on with each other and it's all lovely. Because love and grace move us instinctively towards action, to sharing love. Which brings me on to my third um, thought here, which is about the fruits of partnership. Verse 5 doesn't just talk about partnership, it talks about partnership in the gospel. And in verse 7, again, Paul refers to his activity. He talks about being in chains, defending and confirming the gospel. And so partners in Christ here are also partners in the gospel. And again, that came out in the Teesside video. We're sharing the good news of Jesus in this place. And we're empowering each other in our unique mission. In the passage, as I said, Paul was defending and confirming the gospel. He was praying for the Philippian church. The church were partners with him in supporting Paul in his mission work, as well as being witnesses in Philippi, in the place where God has put them. And you too, I'm sure, are seeing the fruit of your partnership in the gospel in all sorts of different ways here in the church uh, and in the community, as you see people's lives being transformed by the good news of Jesus. And earlier I shared with you, didn't I, some of the fruit of that collaboration across Baptist Together. Churches are growing, and new Christian communities are being planted, leaders are being raised up, and the dignity of all human beings is being proclaimed and enacted. That's what happens when we're partners in the gospel. And as I look across the nation, one of the things I see is that God is stirring up these city-wide movements. Um, and it is a thing, that, it's a God thing, I think. <coughs> Because God's heart is not just for the church, is it? God's heart is for the city. God's heart is for the town. God's heart is for the nation. And he is seeking to spiritually and socially impact our places, whatever they are, for the kingdom. And again, I think as we are in the times that we are in, when we realise there's no more messing anymore, there's no time for our own petty infighting, that we have to stand together for the gospel in our day. And that's one of the things I think that Teesside video brings out. And one of the key players in, in putting that together is a Baptist minister uh, who's got a real heart for this. And he's leading this sense of, um, yeah, cities, not just a heart for us and our church and being great here in an empire will do, but a heart for this city and this place that we might see God's kingdom come. So the main fruit of our partnership in the gospel is mission. But actually, it's not the only one. So if you permit me, I just want to focus for a moment on verses 9 to 11 at the end, which is that prayer. Because if you look at those last few verses, um, the gospel also brings about the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives. So it's not just the fruit of mission kind of out there, 
there's, there's the fruit of partnership in our own lives, yeah? Okay? People often say, and I, as a local church minister I had this, you get that kind of feeling that they need to be a better person, a better Christian, a more knowledgeable disciple before they can serve. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly do this because I don't know enough. I couldn't do that because I've not been a Christian long enough. I hope you don't have that here. But I always used to say to people, they didn't like it really, but it, that it's through serving and through yeah. doing stuff that you actually grow in discipleship. Amen. It's not yeah. till you're actually faced with the prospect of having to go door knocking and uh, take out leaflets and invite people to something that you actually have to start praying for courage and boldness. And, you know, God pushes you out. And as you get pushed out... You know, when you have to have something to share with your small group, you start praying because you need something to share with your small group. You start searching scriptures. And so serving and facing adversity is the context in which God often sanctifies us and brings about the fruit of the Spirit in our life. A slightly different example to share, but I think it illustrates my point. Um, last year, I went to the funeral and Thanksgiving service of a 32-year-old woman. It's always awful. Um, funerals out of season. Funerals are never great. Funerals out of season are never great. But this was particularly painful. It was a deeply moving service. It was full of faith, full of faith, and yet such huge sense of loss. You can imagine the church was absolutely packed. Here was a wonderful and gifted woman of God, married to an equally gifted and amazing pastor. They were partners in the gospel. But a few years previously. Uh, Heather had been diagnosed with cancer and together in great faith they endured suffering and they learned so much about Christ and discipleship on their journey and at the funeral service her husband said this when we began this journey we were just children when we began this journey we were just children and in a sense yes they were young they were only in their late 20s when this, this doesn't kind of normally happen to you at that stage of life but they were also younger in the faith. <laughs> they had been Christians a long time and they were already in leadership. But, but, but they were only children. And I, I just thought, how interesting. It was through the deeply challenging and painful process of suffering that they learned more of God and his ways. <coughs> and the witness was just, like, amazing. And the witness of the, the glorifying of God in their lives on that journey and in that situation was just outstanding. And so when we partner together for the sake of the gospel, we're often just children <laughs> at the start. And it's through the joys and the challenges that our faith grows and Christ-likeness is nurtured. So if you're finding partnership difficult at the moment, working with someone else or thinking about something else, or some I have no clue, that's one wonderful thing about my role, and I just drop in knowing nothing really about what's going on. But if there's some contentious things, take heart and look to Christ. What is he wanting to grow in you? Growing in love, growing in the fruit of the Spirit through these experiences, so that you can mature in discipleship and live a life pleasing to God. So the fruits of partnership are, yes, mission, but also our personal growth as discipleship. Now I want to kind of draw things to a close by looking at my, the final aspect of this, and that is what we might think of as the fulfilment of partnership. Because although we sometimes struggle and our partnerships in the gospel are not always plain sailing, or all we take for, or indeed all that they should have been, there is great hope in this passage, isn't there? Verse 6 says to him, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you would carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is an amazing verse, isn't it? Now, when I was a local church minister, which I was for about 16 years, uh, I had uh, an office in the church, with, yeah, and, I, and out of the window there was a copper beech tree, which was absolutely beautiful. And uh, we'd been through a season of conflict in the church, very difficult, very painful, uh, and one day a member of the church who had actually been very kind to me when we first went to the church so it was particularly poignant and difficult and she came and told me all the things that I was doing wrong uh, as the minister and uh, yeah and she left and I felt like absolutely rubbish totally useless I was a useless minister I was completely rubbish the church was locked into this hideous conflict it was just awful and uh, I, I was deeply deeply discouraged 
and I sat at my desk and I <coughs> looked out at that copper beech tree and uh, as I kind of just went to God and I just felt God said to me one day you will be perfect one day you will be perfect and I just thought yeah you know it might be pants now I might be useless now <laughs> I might be the worst minister ever that hasn't even gone to LST. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was my ass, maybe that's where I went wrong. Um, but actually God said to me, one day you will be perfect. And it kind of somehow just breathed a little spark into me that my, my I, I use the word striving in the, the right way, my kind of pursuing <coughs> of God is not in vain. <laughs> And as I pick myself up, as I learn from what's happening, as they learn from what's happening, because it's always often six or one after the other, but actually together, one day I would be perfect. Keep following, because it doesn't matter how rubbish it is now, one day I am going to be perfect in Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, we may struggle, we may face challenges now, but the outcome is assured. Yeah. <laughs> the outcome is assured. We may think we're not doing great at Monte Carlo Church, but have When we get to heaven, it's going to be amazing. We're going to get there. We look at it. Uh, now is a foretaste, a foretaste of what's come. And we want it to be the best foretaste and prophetic symbol that we can be. But however we fall short, we know that we will get there. We're not labouring in vain. We're not hoping in vain. We're not working through differences in vain. Because God's purposes will be fulfilled. We will be made perfect. And one day, every nation, every knee, every person will bow at the knee of Christ and worship him as Lord and Saviour. So that is just amazing. There's that amazing sense of fulfilment, I think, from this passage. So we continue to rejoice in the partnership in the gospel which with which we've been blessed in this church, in this town, across the nation. The passage reminds us our partnership in the gospel needs to be based on grace, nurtured in the soil of love. We need to seek the fruit of mission and the fruit of the spirit in our own lives in Christ likeness. And we can do all this confident in God's purposes that they will be fulfilled on the day of Jesus Christ. So don't lose heart, church. Keep pursuing this kingdom vision that God has given you because it's a precious thing indeed. And one day you will be there and I will be with you and we will rejoice together. Hallelujah. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.